Welcome to the Inferno Cast. Today's guest is a Muay Thai and MMA fighter that fought in K1 and the UFC. He was a four-time world champ, appeared on MTV True Life, and currently is a professional coach. Kit Cope, how you doing today, buddy? Pretty good. You got you hit all the all the main ones. Hey, man. I just uh, I've been a fan forever because you know, like when I was in college training Muay Thai and getting into MMA like nobody knew what it was like nothing I'm just trying to explain it and they're like is it a drink like it was always really difficult and then when you did that episode on MTV man I was like that's what I do that's what I like it gave me all this street credit with my friends finally I was like I mean I'm not that tough as he is but you know like I was doing Muay Thai so you uh oh, yeah, you it's, saved uh, the whole it's, generation. it's crazy now that uh nowadays that that I'll get more recognition from that. Not like, hey, that's that four-time world champion. Or, hey, that's that, that guy, you know, that, that guy was in UFC or anything like that. No, I get, hey, that's the guy from MTV. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Or, or I'll get the, oh, that, oh, weren't you, weren't you, uh, weren't you Gene Carano's boyfriend? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I did big stuff. Well, yeah. Besides being a boyfriend. Things. <laughs> yeah, I did other things, man. I really did. But, you know, when you look at it, though, like, there was really no mainstream martial arts besides MMA, which even yeah. then, up until that point, MMA was still pretty, like, still, still yeah, it was still very quiet. States. Yeah, And mostly you know, West like, Coast. Yeah. I mean, there was not martial arts on TV for, like, decades, you know, especially mm -hmm. competitive martial arts. And yeah. whenever you Unless it's, like, that, 12 o'clock at night, some you know board breaking tournament yeah. or some the crap like tournament. that yes yeah oh yeah yeah so i found out why those were so prominent um one they were funded by that paul mitchell company but two uh -huh. hollywood agents used that as um a, oh, sure. a tool to I find bet. kids so i was because i was always like how is that what's on tv all the time and then you know the more you talk to people kind of in the industry and it's like well man that's where like a lot of the hollywood talent gets discovered yeah, uh, you know, not it's acrobatics. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's not it just, real fighting. It's pretty stuff. Yeah, and it was just it's so different. And so whenever you got that publicity, man, like, yeah, definitely. I know MTV is like the number one thing. Like, we're showing MTV. Yes. Yeah. But also yep. the other accolades, because man, you're a very legit fighter. They have you have a very good pedigree, and that's what I really wanted to talk about. Was uh, you know, not so much the show and, and the Gina stuff. Was just like, how did martial arts find you, or how did you find martial arts? Oh man, uh, early age, and it it would it started from uh, it started from like movies with dad, like yeah. just bang bang shoot 'em ups and and karate stuff and Bruce Lee movies and with with dad that was like our bonding thing, um, we, you know, father and son bonding over violence, yeah. uh, and um, then. I think the first time that I got to do martial arts, actually do it, was um, there was a Kenpo guy in the small town that we lived in. And uh, so I, I got to do Kenpo. And I, I did, you know, I did it for a few years. I did uh, Ed Parker's tournament a couple years. Um, and uh, always only did uh, with Kumite, which is fighting kind of yeah. um but then i would always get in trouble for um you know uh coming too close on a focus shot or or actually hitting so oh you touched him in the face man that's not cool yeah. okay all right sorry so then when i when i was actually I, I found wrestling after that and so then wrestling became you know that's that's my combat sport so then yeah. I, I wrestled for like eight years. Um, I was actually looking for a something to keep me in shape between wrestling seasons because I did I did you know high school which is folk style and then I did freestyle and Greco after folk uh, style was over yeah. and uh, <clears throat> and then I, I just needed something in that in that interim season to keep me in shape and uh, I was actually uh, I was driving by. Master Toddies yeah. one day and there were there were just like these really cool drawings on the window like old school Thai drawings on the window and I and I had passed it a couple times and it, you know it looked neat and I was like well I wonder what that is I wonder what that is you know it said 
and it didn't say Muay Thai, it said Master Toddies right across the thing. And I'm like, okay, well, that's got to be martial arts, I'm assuming, you know, yeah. or food. And uh, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> so I stop in uh, and I look in the window and I'm like, holy shit, these people are beating the crap out of each other. This is amazing. This isn't martial arts. We punch the air all day. This is awesome. So I went in and uh, uh, I signed up for like a, like a trial lesson. And that trial lesson just happened to be with Melcher Minor, oh, who's man. a world champion. Yeah. yeah, I got to train with him when he was out in San Diego. He was with yeah. Dean Lister. And I got to go yeah. out and train with his team. And I didn't even know it at the time because we're all training, man, and just getting after it. And he, he left. He's like, well, I got this thing to go do. And I didn't know he was filming that uh, – that science show, like oh, fight science thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. I didn't even know that until like three months later, whenever it came out, and they were like, "Yeah, that's what he was doing when you were out here," because he just kept was in and out all the time. Yeah, yeah small world it helps to be in California a lot. Yeah. 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 Uh, so yeah, he beat the crap out of me, and I was, uh, you know, I was sixteen. He beat the crap out of me, and I was like, "Oh yeah, I want that," because I was like, I was state champion wrestler. You know, I was in great shape. I was little, but still and then uh and then this guy just uh, made me feel absolutely helpless i was like yeah i want some of that and so awesome. that that was it instantly instantly fell in love yeah so whenever you started training with master toddy and all the guys and mel was it just like five days a week as much as you could be there um the new obsession like did wrestling fall by the wayside or was it always a compliment Oh, no. Yeah, it was definitely full go from the start. Um, <clears throat> and not even just like the five days a week thing. I would, I would, so in the, in a year, I'm, and it, it, it'll sound like I'm bragging from time to time, but it was just, Muay Thai was my thing. Like yeah. I, I, I wrestled for eight years and then I realized in the first few months in Muay Thai that I'm better at this than wrestling. Like, this is very natural for me. Well, some and people so, have predispositions, uh, you know, it's yeah, like, it's like absolutely. reading and math, you know, some people have predispositions. So, I mean, I don't feel like it's, you know, arrogant of you to, you know, to kind of identify that this came more natural to you and it kind of fit your athletic yeah. prowess and things of that it was nature. Very so, I mean, natural. Yeah, yeah, very natural. And then, uh, <clears throat> Uh, let's see. I was, I was in high school still, uh, when I started fighting and, um, wrestling season came around and I was going to the high school that I was going to, to wrestle specifically. That's why we were going to that high school. And so, uh, wrestling season came around and I was like, no, nah, I'm into this thing, you know? And I was, uh, there were, qualifiers for um the u.s team coming up right at the time that wrestling was starting and so i was like oh man let's see do i do i go to thailand and wear red white and blue or do i go to reno and wear my school colors I was like, oh so, title, man. Yeah, so yeah u.s team it was so i was the youngest Youngest ever on the U.S. team. I was 17. Um, went to Thailand for the World Championships, IMTF World Championships. Uh, me, Melcher Minor, Steve Mills from from New yeah. York, yeah. and um, and uh, uh, DJ Ob1, Ben Garcia, who's now DJ Ob1. Right, right. Yeah. Now, super famous DJ guy. Yeah, yeah. So no, but he was a Muay Thai yeah. fighter first, which is awesome. Oh yeah, and it's hilarious because as a DJ, he's just very, he's very quiet, you know, and he's 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 just kind of like, you know, reserved into himself, you know, and then people find out that you, oh, you did violence for a living. Oh, yeah. oh, that's very that's strange. Cool. Yeah, yeah, that's weird. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, plus he's, you know, he's in that world where he's surrounded by civilians. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, went to world championships, 
Uh, and then after that, I was still in high school and I would, I would ditch school on like a Monday and a Friday and just be at the gym for four days. Oh just man. Nonstop. And I would have, uh, so once I was on the U S team, U S team events are excused absences in high school. So I was just like, yep, U S team event. <laughs> we got to do stuff, you know, PR and stuff. But, oh yeah. Yeah. Big deal. Yeah. Big deal. And I would just, yeah, so I would just, I would just train. I would just train yeah. all weekend. So oh, it man. was a, it was full blown addiction from the, from the get go. Obsession. You know, oh, for sure. For yeah. sure. So what was your experience like when you went to Thailand for the first time? Was it culture shock? Was it like you were just a kid having fun, didn't care, didn't notice anything? Like when you go to Thailand now versus when you went to Thailand then, what's kind of, what do you see kind of differently? Um, well, Thailand itself hasn't changed a whole lot. Um, but uh, when, I, when I first went when I was 16 um, – it was, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say culture shock, more of just like, it was just very exciting. It was very exciting. I had already, from being so involved in the gym, um, you know, Muay Thai is very cultural, you know? And so like, you don't just learn how to kick and punch. You also learn language and you learn traditions and, you know, so... Uh, so I was already, I was already pretty well up on, on the Thai culture by the yeah. time I went. Um, and so it was just super exciting, you know, as a 16 year old kid, oh, as a 16 year old kid who's getting handed, you know, a bottle of beer on the street, you right, know, yeah, from, yeah. From, Complete freedom. Yeah. from a street restaurant, you know, no yeah. big deal, you yeah. know, you so it was actually that was hard really learning. cool as a, as a kid, you know. Now when I go, it's a uh, it's a little it's a little different because I have a uh, I have a name there now, and so I get recognized and that kind of thing now. Um, uh, and then of course speaking Thai helps yeah. a lot. Right. Like when you when you speak Thai in Thailand, you make instant friends because it's such a hard language to speak. It's tonal. So there's five different tones. You can say the same exact thing in a different tone, and it means something totally different. And uh, and so, but if you even just try, just try, you know, just so I need up to somebody, you're gonna mess it up. If 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 you haven't really spent time in it, you're gonna mess it up because it's very difficult. Doesn't matter to them. They they could not even understand anything that you say, but they're like, oh my. You love Thai people? Yeah. You speak Thai? Do you eat spicy? Oh, yeah, I love spicy. <gasps> you eat spicy? <laughs> Do you love Thai women? Uh, Thai women are beautiful. You're, you're my, my brother. brother. My brother, yeah. You're my brother. Yeah. Brothers now. Oh. Yeah. So growing up out west, the California culture, you know, and Master Toddy's always been, you know, hardcore traditionalist, like, you know, his Muay Thai is, you know, world renowned. Yeah as far as like the full culture influence, how did that culture kind of influence you as, as a young kid with just like coming up in the Western belief systems and, you know, our American culture and then getting introduced to this whole different way of life that was so much older and just different value systems? Yeah, that's, a, I mean, that's a really good question. Um, I would say that, that the, it was, it was an easier transition for me because I had, you know, like my, my dad that was very worldly and, and into, into martial arts and that kind of thing. And, um, you know, and he, he'd been around the world and seen some stuff and, and shared that kind of thing with me. And, uh, so what I found was that the value system, um, uh, the, the morality, the value system was, very similar to because I, I actually I mean I've been in Vegas for a long time but I you know I grew up like in Oklahoma and Wyoming and all over the place because um, military dad and then uh, <clears throat> the so I, I spent 
farm time, right? I spent a lot of farm time. And so my, all my people are farm people. And it's, it's very, uh, very, very similar to the, to the culture in like all of Thailand, but especially, you know, like farm Thailand, farming here is farming there. And, uh, and like the, the, like I said, the value system is very, very similar, you know, in yeah. Thailand as it is to like the country. Right. You know, like, uh, yeah, I'd say more country than South. People don't really know the difference between Southern and country. There is a difference. Um, yeah. I'm talking more country than Southern. Right. Okay. Yeah. Cause you know, a lot of times when people get absorbed into, to something new and it takes them into other cultures it's kind of like whenever people go fight in japan and end up living in japan for several years like just it's a different culture and sometimes it really speaks to them and they just connect with this country you know and these people yeah. just in a different way um yeah well so, japan would be an easy one i can see doing that much easier in japan because you are a you're an upper class citizen so japan still lives by bushido they, mm -hmm. they still have a warrior culture. So you've got like, like royalty and then fighters and then everybody else. Right. So as a fighter, like you are, you're very well taken care of in Japan. I, yeah. I never carried a bag, opened a door, nothing. Like they were, they were very, uh, very adamant about that. As a matter of fact, it's, it's, it almost hurts their feelings if you're like, no, no, I'll carry my own shit. You know, like it hurts. Well, their, so yeah. you get really well taken care of. I could see how staying there and, and remaining a, a, you know, demigod would, <laughs> <laughs> would, well, would be know. very easy. Well, think about all the, the kids, you know, the young guys and, and girls that, you know, especially, especially young guys, because that's all I can speak for is when I got into fighting, man, like a lot of it was ego driven of like, you know, I wanted to show people how tough I was. I wanted to show what I could accomplish. And it took me yeah. a lot of, it took me a lot more years to kind of like turn into where as an athlete, as a competitor to testing yeah. myself. But the first part was like all pride ego, like, no, look what I can do. Um, so, you know, in that, in that Japanese appreciation, like you mentioned, that's almost what you're seeking. Like when a lot of these guys get into martial arts, like yeah, well, absolutely. When I get good, everybody's going to respect me and they're going to treat me better, which is like not true. Um, but not, that's not true at all. Be the no, you got to sock people we, for that. Yeah, you know that we go into. So whenever you were looking at Muay Thai and being competitive, was your driving force more external, like the accolades, what you wanted to achieve, or was it more internal, or like man, this is testing who I am, it's testing how tough I am? Where do you feel like that uh, drive came from? It was. Um, I would say it was a, it was n nothing more complicated than the fun. It was just so much fun. Just that, that's it. I just had so much fun. It was, uh, you know, just like, like if I go to a bar or something, I don't want to sit at the bar. You know, I don't want to go to a nightclub and sit at the table and people watch. Like I want to go to the bar and shoot pool or play shuffleboard or beer pong or something, you know, like I want to do something. And yeah. this was something that I, that I could do and was really good at and was, and you could really, I could really see like, like, Ooh, I, I wasn't this good last month, you know, like I couldn't do this last month and you know, now I can't. So you could, I could really see the, like the progression and, and, the whole ocean of Muay Thai ahead of me, you know, there's, you never stop learning ever. There's so much, it never ends. And so I was like, oh, this thing goes on forever. I can do this forever and I can still learn and still get better forever. So it was, it was really, it was the, the vastness that, that intrigued me. And then just the, it's just so much damn fun. Yeah. Well, man, when you, when you talk to high level performers and achievers, a lot of them talk about, you know, the passion and joy of the training. Like you got to find the, the passion and joy in the training because that's what allows you to play loose. I've heard that term, mm -hmm. you know, or find mm -hmm. the flow state or get in the zone. 
yeah, yeah. Uh, because if you're, if you're living too much in the past of like, oh, that's what happened last time or too much in the future of like, what if this, what if that, you don't perform well as an athlete. So Absolutely. with you having all this joy and enjoying the process, where do you feel like that bled over into other stuff outside of the gym and outside of fighting? Like, you know, was it helping you on the outside at all of just like, Man, you know, when I kind of approach this the same or Yeah, I was I was um, you know, I was a little dude when I started, especially when I started. My first I had my first fight at 118. Yeah. That's like six foot always. tall. That's six foot tall, yeah. 118. Yeah, I had my like, second fight at 126. So yeah, I was uh um, like, man, like <laughs> I, was, I was I'm six foot, like, you know, I fought at 135, you know, when I was an adult, like and as a yeah. kid, I'm like, you know, 119, 120, like, I'm feeling your, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, So I was a, I was a little guy, so it, it definitely gave me a confidence that I didn't have that I carried into everything. And now, now it, you recognize it now, um, you're, or, or at least as an adult, where you walk into a room and you know, you take the quick scan and you're like, I'm gonna be okay. Yeah. You know, no matter what happens in here, I'm gonna be okay. Yeah. You know, I can, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not worried about any of these people. Yeah. You know, um, and just, just with that, just the comfort of that. And I, and I, I don't, I don't think that a lot of fighters understand and appreciate that they have that. Yeah. Because they're just used to being around other fighters and that kind of thing. We have a comfort in public settings that other people don't have. They don't get to have, you know, and that comfort really lets us absorb everything else. So it, it really leads into uh, enjoying the whole of life a whole lot easier, a whole lot yeah. better. Well, it's like that comfortable confidence allows you to connect with people, find opportunities. Like you get to be yourself easier and, and, mm -hmm. and you know, and something comes out of it that never would have come out of it if you're sitting in the corner because you're paranoid, fearful, intimidated, you know, people judging you, et cetera. When it's like, oh man, I get in a ring in my freaking underwear and punch people in the face. Sometimes I win, sometimes I lose. Like being in this room with all these people, you know, everybody's watching people. and everybody's excited. Yeah, you know, and so it just, it turns the volume down on these other situations, which I think has led to some opportunities for you because, you know, like when we met, you know, I mean, that was like 10 years ago in the middle of Missouri, like some MMA show when we're stuck there for like two days. Mm -hmm. um, that was one thing I noticed was like your outgoing personality and connection with people was so authentic. And it was just like, if there was an opportunity to be found in that, in that little get together, you would find it, you know, you're going to go talk to the guy that's running the whole show. Who owns this casino? Hey man, what do you do? Like, it was just, and I could see the opportunities where people, they think, man, you're lucky opportunities find you. And really, you know, you going out and just being open and connecting with people. Being open, being open. That's the thing. Yeah. That, being, well, that and it, it's really not just a, like being open as in like, as in like, yeah, I'm, I'm available. I'm open, but it's, it's being open and out there because you're comfortable because you're yeah. comfortable out there you know and yeah. and when you it's there's also a thing where when you do violence for a living um there are you're you're put in a very specific category and there are people that are going to frown on that and there are people that are going to think that's the coolest thing ever as long as you're resigned to the position that you're in, then it's very, very comfortable. Uh, in the beginning of, in the beginning, when, it, when I first started fighting and, you know, people didn't even know what MMA was and nobody knew what Muay Thai was. And it was just, you know, at, the martial arts that everybody knew was their kids in white geese. That's, that's the martial arts that everybody knew. And so, uh, when they found out that you were a, an, an actual pugilist, you know, some people were like, uh, you know, human cockfighting, you know, and, and, oh, that's terrible. Oh, you're, you're a violent person or something like that. You know, no, I'm, I'm, I'm an athlete. Exactly. 
I'm, I'm an athlete. This is a, this is an athletic endeavor. I'm a professional athlete. I put in more time and effort into my athletic endeavor than most sports do. You know, I, I have, I have friends that are professional athletes all across the board and I, baseball players train for like an hour and a half, two hours a day, you know, like, no, no, no. Our stuff is a little more complicated than that. Your entire life has to be dedicated to it because if it's not, you get really hurt. Yeah. Yeah. Serious so it's, consequences. It's, it's a different, yeah, it's a, it's a different, uh, it's a different, uh, it's a different thing than, than other, you know, sports, uh, games, I would say, you know, I call them yeah. games, game sports, like ball sports. Mm -hmm. Um, um, but the people that appreciate it, right. You get to be a superhero. You get to be a superhero because you get to do your sport with just this. You don't yeah. have to throw me a ball. I don't have to be on a court. I don't have to be in a special place. or anything. I can do everything that I do right now. And there's power in that. I agree. That's, That's why awesome. we're like the baseball bat breaking. Man, yeah. I've done so many like last minute baseball bat breakings <laughs> just yeah. because it's a cool party trick. That you can that you can do that other people yeah, can't everybody do. Everybody loves it too, man. They're like, "Oh my gosh, his leg is gonna break." There's no way. Yeah, yeah. that that's yeah. a shin conditioning which they don't do nowadays. Yeah, nowadays things are a little bit different. Soft. You know, and, and you know, <laughs> soft, smarter, whatever. You know? Yeah, 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 it is. <laughs> it is way smarter. So they have like now they have Muay Thai's changed so much as I'm sure you're aware, and that's. In my opinion, that's because back in the day, if you were an athlete and you liked and you and you liked martial arts, you you did Muay Thai because that was an actual competition, physical competition. You know, there you go. Now, if you're an athlete and you like martial arts, you fight MMA because yeah. there's way more money and more exposure, you know, it's way more popular. And so that left a hole in the Muay Thai community that was filled up by all the karate geeks. Yeah. And when I say karate geeks, I don't mean that, you know, you're geeky just because you do karate or something. But what I yeah. mean is it's a different kind of person. It's yeah. a different kind uh, of person. It's a different that, experience too, because yeah. like, you know, nobody ever got into Muay Thai because they wanted to get rich. You know, like, like, like there was never like yeah. now people are getting into MMA because they're like, yeah, bro, I'm gonna make a million dollars. Like, yeah, you know, absolutely. Guy. So you got into Muay Thai because it was the ultimate test that you could find, and then mm -hmm. MMA became that as well. And it was like those were the two choices, you know, MMA and Muay Thai. So usually you were doing both um, if you could. Yeah. It was just the yeah. Ultimate test of self, and now as it has evolved it's a little bit more of like a resume piece where like, yeah, I do Muay Thai because, you know, I'm a martial arts guy. Um, and it's a little bit less of that crucible of like, what can you put your body through and recover? Yeah. And, and you know, which is probably healthy. I mean, cause like you had head concussions, like those are real. Oh man. Body breaks, the overtraining like, that we did, the yeah. overtraining was, that was just a normal thing. Dude, now, yeah. see, now I'm a, so I'm a sports performance coach is what I went to school for. Mm -hmm. And so n now I actually know better, <laughs> but that doesn't change my training at all. Why? Because this is just how we've been doing it for the last couple thousand years. Yeah. And so, you know, I'll get a little more, uh, you know, I'll get a little more down to a little more rest, you know, and I'll be smarter about my rest and smarter about my recovery. But the overtraining is still there, of course. Yeah. Um, I mean, my coach uh, but in Muay Thai, at least, you don't do all of the, like, you don't do all the weight cutting, you know, right. in Muay Thai. If, if you're smart, you don't do all the weight right. cutting because it doesn't matter as much. Dude, when I was in, I want to say it was October of 1999. <laughs> oh, we're going back. Uh, I believe it was October of 1999. I fought 147, 
then I fought 154, then I fought 140, all in a month, all in 30 days, because I didn't care. I didn't care yeah. what, what, I walked around at like 142, yeah. and wherever the fight was, there you go. But, but it doesn't count as, it doesn't matter as much in Muay Thai. It doesn't matter, matter as much if you have good technique. You don't need the, the weight, the strength, if you have good technique. Punching right. power comes from technique, not from being big. You know, yeah. However, distance, wrestling place. power comes from being big and strong. You know, right. it counts so much more in the grappling than it does in the, in the striking. Well, so whenever you were doing Muay Thai, competing, how did the MTV discussion even come up? Like, they called. They called. They apparently so that the, uh, the producer, uh, his name is Patrick Lope, is Patrick Lope, I'm sure. Um, and, uh, uh, yeah, he's like a he's like a bazillionaire now from from because he did like a a Bitcoin documentary at the beginning of Bitcoin. Oh wow! Yeah. And then bought a bunch of Bitcoin at like thirty cents yeah, a piece. Yeah. Genius. <laughs> That's not insider trading. It's fine. So, um, but Patrick Lope, super good dude, really good dude, love him. Um, he found out what Muay Thai was at um, uh. I believe it was Crunch Gym in New York. And so he asked them like, hey, who's the, like, who's the hotness right now? If, if we wanted to do a, a, a documentary, who would be the hotness right now? They sent, they sent him to Colorado to Sven Bean because mm -hmm. Sven was a matchmaker for the K1, which is not Muay Thai, but you know, close they punch they kick yeah, he knows yeah, people. Yeah. yeah so um he called sven bean and uh sven said well right now can kit's kind of the guy in las vegas and so they called up called up jim said hey we're doing documentary and it just so happened that i just accepted a spot on the thai national team to fight against burma for the yeah. bear, for Muay Thai yeah. that they have every year. Um, and so the funny part about it is it's called True Life, I'm a Muay Thai fighter. We didn't fight Muay Thai. We fought, <laughs> we fought Muay Thai chip, you know, bare yeah. knuckle, bare yeah. knuckle Muay Thai. But, you know. Which was, was even more, which was even more street credit for the rest of yeah. us. Because we're like, yeah. <laughs> right? They didn't even oh, that's Muay Thai? Glass, like on blood sport. Yeah. And in Muay Kajuk, it's like uh, you got headbutts, groin strikes, yeah. kicking people on the ground. As long as you can get it in before the referee gets there, before one of the two referees gets there. Yep, they have two refs. Then, yeah, then you're it's golden. Like and if there's not a knockout, there's not, there's not a win. Yeah. If there's not a knockout, it's a draw. Nobody wants a draw. That's like kissing your sister. So, <laughs> yeah, so uh, everybody goes, you know. Full out, and it's bare knuckles, so it's like it's the the knockouts happen, you yeah. know. And so I, I just accepted that fight. These guys, MTV called and said, "Hey, we're doing this documentary thing. Right on, come on through." Yeah. And then it actually ended up being um, the most watched documentary in MTV history. Is that nuts? That's wild. It's, it's, it's gotta crazy. be the violence, man. It's gotta it's, be the violence. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Especially love that violence. Time, because like at that time, there was not real fights on TV. Like if you watched UFC oh, yeah, yeah. pay-per-view or VHS tape, you had to buy somewhere. Like you know, Yeah, you, you had to wait access. for it to come into video time and rent it for $9.99. Yeah. Uh, you know, and just like the younger generation was not finding, you know, MMA very much. Like, you know, like I mean it was a right. little bit, Absolutely. but it's martial arts nerds, you know, like Mm -hmm. All of those guys that were kind of into yes. it was a very small percentage. Yes. Nobody mainstream that would be watching MTV with that type of, you know, value system or perspective on life. Like, nobody would be seeing that. Mm -hmm. But now that it's put in their medium, it's like, oh, well, that's now cool. And I appreciate that. And just that intrigue of the violence. Because, yeah. I mean, combat sports, man, for since human beings have been around, man, violence attracts the the awe, you know, and the attention. Yeah. Of like, yeah. what's the – what is the – 
So I would say, and I've had this debate before, um, uh, and, and it's because violence is, violence is so natural, so natural for humans. Babies that are, that, you know, that can't speak a word, when they get pissed off, they hit people. It's just very, very natural. Um, <clears throat> and so when I was in, I was in New York doing the, uh, doing, I was hosting the True Life Marathon, like mm -hmm. uh, at the MTV studios. Uh, and that was my first time like out and about in New York by myself, you know, and, and so uh, uh, people would ask, you know, oh, hey, hey, what are you doing here? And so I'd tell them, oh yeah, I'm over here doing that. And nobody knew what, nobody knew what MMA was. Nobody knew what MMA, because I was like, oh yeah, I do. Of course nobody knew what Muay Thai was, but that we already know that part. But nobody knew what MMA was. And this is like, this is going to be 2004 probably. Yeah. And nobody in New York knew what MMA was. It was still such a West Coast sport, you know? And, uh, and then now to see it just, just take off. You know, and, and shoot past Muay Thai, where it's very confusing. It is very confusing because when you're at an MMA fight and everybody's cheering, everybody's having a good time, it's because they're doing Muay Thai. Yeah, yeah, it's whenever they're punching and kicking. <laughs> right? they're on the ground and when they're rolling around on the ground. And, and, when when the around on the ground, and now, now, now that I have, you know, now that I, I, I'm, I'm purple belt in jiu-jitsu, so... Now I, that I understand the jujitsu game, I love watching jujitsu because yeah. I get it. Yeah, but that's a small but, percentage. But your 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 general, you know, I would just say your your average UFC fan, yeah. it just sees two guys hugging each other, rolling around, you know, and then they get booze and they're disinterested, that kind of thing. Then when they start doing Muay Thai, everybody's excited. Guess what, guys? They have that part all by itself. No other options. I mean, you can even get I it with takedowns. With like, uh, you can do like some sand chai where you got some takedowns if you yeah, want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They got options, so, man. Yeah. So that that it's it's very strange to me that everybody loves MMA and nobody pays attention to Muay Thai. Well, man, I think except it really for when it's in MMA. The, I think it really goes back to the marketing machine that was behind Absolutely. that. I mean, like. Dan yep. and the boys, they busted their tail so hard, just like push it, push it, push yep. it. Um, you know, like they, they were able to brand it. You know, like you hear in the business world, McDonald's doesn't have the best hamburger in the world, but they sell the most in the world. So it's not quality, you know, that dictates oh, yeah, yeah. a lot of the, the open it's, market. It's marketing counts, man. And, yeah. and the problem with Muay Thai is it, it's the problem and it's the beauty. It's so rooted in culture it's a martial art and they bill it as a martial art instead of a combat sport yeah so when you're marketing to americans especially martial arts oh okay that's for our kids yep you know yep. combat sports that's where it's yeah. at yeah yeah yeah, yeah. So I think, man, I'll, I'll tell you what, I think that, uh, and, I'm, and I'm getting ready to actually open up a gym here in, a, in, in about a month. Awesome. Um, and you just have to, you, you cannot market it as martial arts to Americans. You, got, you, mar you market it still as what it is, which is a, the gnarliest, most brutal combat sport on the planet. You know? The only difference, I guess, you know, uh, Savat, they wear shoes. Okay, that's, sure. it's kind of, that's kind of mean, but, yeah, you know, that's still, <laughs> boy time. So, yeah. uh, if you bill it like that, I think that, I think that you'll get a lot, I think that you'll get a lot more attention, unfortunately, getting away from the martial artsness of it, you know, and I, I think that that's what, that's what's held it back. That's that's the it's not compromise. exciting. It's not X Games. -y. Yeah, yeah. That's that's the compromise. Nobody, you know, has been re really willing to push. But you know, do you remember the WCL? Yeah, absolutely. World Combat League. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 
so I think that that like really had potential because I remember uh, like my coach had a fighters fight in it and I had a bunch of friends that were competing and um, man, it was really exciting. And who would have guessed that these karate point fighters, when you tell them, hey man, go hit this dude as hard as you can, would like be, that would just go so well for them, you know? Um, and I just, I'm really shocked that I didn't gain more momentum, but I think it goes back to once again, like how much money you're willing to put in because like Fertitas were millions of dollars into the UFC when it was hitting the hole. Like, you know, they almost pulled the plug. $44 million. $44 yeah, million you know, like, dollars in the hole before it turned a profit. Yeah. So you got Chuck Norris over there like, bro, man, I put like a hundred grand in. Like, I think we're done. You know, like, you know, he probably was just like, I'm committed, but I don't know if I'm that committed. So, <laughs> so um, I actually got a call from Guy Metzger. <laughs> Um, when that, when oh, that yeah, started, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I got a call from Guy Metzger um, yeah. because Chuck Norris wanted me to fight and Guy knew me. And yeah. so he wanted me to, to be like a team captain of one of the teams. Yeah. Um, but I was, I was at the time I was trying to make my MMA, MMA thing happen. You know, well, so. that's where the money was at, man. Like, yeah. if, if you could just make one little, you know, one little run, get a little bit of fame, yeah. you know, that you can. And when they started, after. when the, when the, when, the, and you know, it, it's different when you're marketable, you know, when you're, yeah. when you're outgoing, personable, you know. Um, yeah, I feel, I feel so bad for those, for those guys that are so good, such good fighters. They just can't, you can't put a camera on them. Yep. It's just, it's the, the branding part of it. Um, I've got friends that yeah. fight UFC, um, and we have that discussion often where I'm like, dude, it's, it's branding, man. Like it's, it's like Hulk Hogan is not Terry, you know, the person like, right. like it's branding. Right. You got to kind of do this thing. And they just look at me like, I just want to punch you yeah. in the face, man. You know, like it just, uh, like, uh, it. Ben Rothwell. Yep. Ben Rothwell. Oh, it's so uncomfortable when he gets on camera. It's so yeah. uncomfortable. I just, I, I mostly just don't even watch anymore. I'm like, okay, fight's over. Yeah. It's so cringy when he gets on camera, but that dude knows how to put punches where they belong. Yeah. You know, and there's a ton of those guys. There's a ton of those guys that people will never know about. Yeah. People will never know about uh, Tarek. Uh, I got a buddy named Tarek. I think his last name is Aziz. His name is Tarek. He works up there, up in the, up in the, up in NorCal with, uh, with Jake and Gil, Jake mm, Shields yeah. and Gilbert Melendez. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and he's been with them for like fucking 20 years, 25 years. Very talented, very talented. Nobody will ever know who that guy is. Cause he's not a, he's not, and he's very nice too. He's just not a in cam on camera guy, you know, yeah. like Tim Elliott. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That dude is impossible to fight. I wanted to fight him so bad because it's just like, what's gonna happen? Like, I don't even, I don't even know what to do. I wouldn't even come up with a game plan. I would just see what happens. Yeah, yeah, because he would happen. That's yeah. what he's doing. So, but not the best guy on camera, yeah. you know. So they don't push him. They don't push him to the top. Yeah, I mean, it's like it's really turned into like the entertainment business. I was talking to talking to Ensign Inouye about this because it was like, man, there was the original guys. Do what? I said, there's a name. Oh man, him and Egan, like, oh man, OGs. Yeah, like, so what? I was, I was going to fight Egan at the Blaisdell in Hawaii for, really? um, uh, what were those fights? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Icon. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Icon. Yeah. Okay, right? Icon fights. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. He ended up fighting like, uh, like uh, uh, Neo Samurai or somebody else. Yeah, you know, some Japanese guy or something like that. But I massive respect for the for the Inoues. Man, I'm telling you, and and, and I was talking to Nansen because it's like there's the original guys, where it's like style against style, that kind of like yeah. MMA, yeah, yeah. that kind of got some recognition. Then there was that next generation that I kind of was like put instant into. It was like you guys developed up sport fighting. For Americans, you know, because Muay Thai has been the sport fighting for ever. But for mm -hmm. Americans, it was like this MMA sport fighting developed. And then there's like the third generation where it converted into the entertainment business. And and I feel like that's where it definitely lives now. Oh, um, yeah. Oh, 
you know, when you gotta have when you can talk manager. yourself into a fight, that's that's where it's at. Yeah, I, and that, and that's how your future is dictated too. I mean, because it's like if you are not the personality and the persona that they can market and push, I mean, the money doesn't come, which I get. And that's one thing. Like when you look at Muay Thai, I feel like it was a little bit different. It was almost like Pride back in the day, where it was just like if it was an exciting fight, they were all in. You know, it was just like win or lose. If you come in yeah. and you're there to throw down, like you're good. Yeah. Yep. Um, didn't matter if you won. Didn't at all. You just, if yeah. you hung it out, yeah. that's it. And that's the way that they are. That's the way that they are in Muay Thai. You know, if you, as long as you hang it out, you can get knocked out every fight. They will yeah. love you. Yeah. Dude, look at how many, look at how many fights um, uh, Phil Baroni had. Yeah. He was a, oh man, loved him. But man, his record was like not very good. It was good. terrible. Man. Phil was a terrible, terrible fighter. But that is not a name I've heard in a while, man. That takes me back. He fought with a hundred percent of everything he had. He, yeah. he threw everything that he had in every punch, and either he was going to knock somebody into next year, or yeah. he was going to go out. Like yeah. that, was, and you knew. The, oh, it's uh, a Phil Baroni fight. Somebody's getting knocked out. He, he was on the Dan Henderson plan without the wrestling prowess. <laughs> <You> know, like, <laughs> Uh, it was just going to be bombs. I always remember whenever Matt Linlin and him were going at it, and they were always yep. like, Matt was always pushing those photos of Phil when he's like out in the water in the, the beach, you know? <laughs> the, uh, the modeling, his modeling photos. <laughs> yeah, man. Hey, man. It you got to make a living, news. right? <laughs> yeah, you got to make a living. It gets tough. Yeah. <laughs> it's, you know, well, so how do you look at training as you get older? Like, you know, because, man, a lot of people, they move to jujitsu because they're like, man, I just can't take the damage, you know, and the miles yeah. of striking. So what does that look like for you who's like a devout striker? You've got a multiple discipline background. You've accomplished a lot of things in different martial arts styles. And, and then like in general, it's just like you have a perspective that's going to be different than a jujitsu guy doing jujitsu later in life versus a true right. striker. So right, what right. does that look like? Well, I'll tell you what, the, <clears throat> the, the way that I trained coming up the entire time, we all, we, we trained here like we, and I lived in Thailand for like a year and a half, you know, and trained the same way there. But like, we don't, we don't put headgear on to spar. We don't put big gloves on usually to spar. You know, we usually use bad gloves. Sometimes we'll wear shin pads. Sometimes we won't. Never a cup. Mouthpiece was like personal preference because you spar at 20, 30%. Because I don't want to get stupid in the training room. <laughs> I don't want to pay for this in the training room, you know? Yeah. Not to mention, you cannot learn that way. You can't learn that way. If you're gonna, if you're gonna hit a baseball, if you need to learn how to hit a baseball, you don't go to the baseball hitter place. What do they call those things? A batting cage. Yeah. Cage. Yeah, batting cage. <laughs> Should it cage? Come on. Yeah. Oh, you no. Don't go to the bat fine, yeah, I'm right. good. <laughs> you don't go to the batting cage and go up to the 100-mile-an-hour fastball and drop your quarters and, and start winging them. You yeah. go to the 25-mile-an-hour ball. That way, you can actually see what you're doing. You can do it on purpose. You know, it's the same way for training Muay Thai. You, you spar at 20 to 30%. If I can hit you, if I can move you into an area where I can destroy you slowly and smoothly, that means that I did it correctly. And now when I add speed and power, I own you but I have to learn how to get you to that spot before I can add the speed and power. And I can't do it if I'm going at full speed. I got to learn how to get you there first. And so, so I, I haven't taken a lot of damage, you know, uh, through the years, uh, at least head damage. I haven't, I haven't taken any brain damage. Right? right. And that was actually, that was kind of one of the things that, I would say that's probably one of the major major things that that helped me do as well as I did. I don't like getting hit. Yeah, I don't like getting punched in the face. I know dudes that do. I think they're lying. Yeah. 
you know, like in parts of the face. And so I was really good at moving my face. And if you can move your face and hit the other face more, you usually end up winning. And so yeah. I got really, I was really good at just naturally just moving my face out of the way. Um, so I didn't take a lot of damage. As a matter of fact, in my, in my, Except for the ver my very last K1 fight, in my five Muay Thai fights prior to that, I got hit in the face an average of two times a fight. So I got really good at moving my face. And yeah. so since I didn't take all that damage, you know, I, I get to still, you know, I get to still talk to you. Yeah. No yeah. answer. <laughs> Yeah, and answer questions. You're not drooling. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Talk so, to Phil. Talk so to then Phil. you would uh oh man. Oh, so you would it's so sad. So you would say that methodology and and partners and speed is where the longevity's at, so where you can train as you get older. Absolutely. Absolutely. If is it I can I'll be able to do this. I'll be able to do this until you know, until I can't walk anymore because so, i didn't take all that damage especially in the training room like i i i, I was a uh, i opened up the the van training center for vanderlei yeah. um uh, and i was the first muay thai coach there uh for a couple of years and those dudes fight all the time in the gym full fights and i got really good really really good at Moving my feet. I think that that actually upped my game so much because now, now, like, I realize how important footwork is. You know, there's the greatest boxer on the planet is Mayweather. Oh, That's I'm going go with Vasil Lomachenko. Really? Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. I'm, okay. And, and, re and the reason that I would say that is because, um, he, he moves his feet. He's always in your freaking blind spot. You're always getting hit with shit that you had no idea was coming, as opposed to just a dude that's really freaky fast. Right. Yeah, um, yeah I can see that. Yeah, anyway, but it's all footwork. It's all, <laughs> it's all, it's all, he, you need your feet to carry you to the spot where you need to deliver your payload, you know? And, his feet are just so good because of all his dancey stuff and 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 the, his training is ridiculous. Just yeah. and, and I really believe in his training, which is just you do everything. You make your body move in every which way that it possibly can. Therefore, you make those neuromuscular connections to be able to make it happen at any time. Right. You know, so I do think methodology is is a, a paramount. Um. Uh, and, and it's, I think that it's, as I'm growing and, and, uh, I was breaking it down more and more. Um, I, I think I'm able to see a lot more now as a coach than I could when I was fighting. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, just, you know, that outside view and just becoming a, a student of the game from a, like a, a scientific perspective almost yeah, you know absolutely. Like, it's absolutely. like doing math and geometry on it like mm, that foot this foot you know that distance but you know 100%. i've been i've been talking to like a lot of world-class jiu-jitsu guys that are a lot older and something they keep saying is like well i love jiu-jitsu because i can do it forever because all i have to do is have the right training partner adjust the right amount of contact and, and run a methodology that is mm -hmm. advantageous, like no inversions and all that. And as a striker, because I'm much more of a striker, because I've done that way more in my life, but I'm a jiu-jitsu guy mm -hmm. as well. But as a striker, I'm like, well, you can do that in striking, but you do have to have very good partners and a, and a very good partners. set up. Um, and I think that that's maybe the bigger piece of it is most people don't have high-level coaches, good partners, so nobody gets a taste of that. And especially mm -hmm. when you're like doing any kind of other martial arts, just like for you, like when you started doing jujitsu, nobody's like, oh yeah, man, let me just show you this thing. They're like, here, let me just rip your arm off. So that way you <laughs> see like 
I know stuff too, even though you're a striker. Yeah, you know, like, yeah, 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 yeah. We all oh, know the treatment we get when ain't no world like, champion on this mat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've all been that guy. Uh, whenever yeah. you're a, a multiple martial artist, like you know, they're always checking yeah. you. Um, but it's just like it's the same theory because just like a BJJ school, you can go into certain schools where there are no easy roles. Like you're going to get annihilated no matter who you are, what day it is. Like you're going to get thrashed. Your elbow's going to get popped. They're going to hold the choke too long. That exists in the world. Just like yeah, when you walk sure. to a striking gym, you're going to have guys that just take your head off and you have a concussion. But oh, yeah. they also exist. Our places oh, where you go in. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so they also have gyms where it's like you go into jiu-jitsu and like it's super chill. Like everybody takes care of you. Just like they're striking gyms where it's going to be super chill. Nobody has anything to prove because, like, they're world class athletes. They know how to train smart. Because when you look you at learn boxing, so much more. Yeah, absolutely. You absorb that information, you know, yeah. because whenever you're in panic mode, like, and especially when you're half concussed, you're not learning anything, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but when you look okay. at boxing, like, boxing evolved really well about, like, them bringing in specialized partners, like, sparring partners, yeah, yeah. you know, a lot of them drill-oriented. Well, I mean, Muay Thai and, and, and striking arts have the same theories that exist, you know, that can run the same model. But like you said, there's not as mainstream. Um, yeah, and boxers, boxers fight, too. Yeah. Boxers, bye, babe. Boxers fight, that's, that's the next, uh, that's my next big fighter right there, my wife. Yeah. She had her she had her first MMA fight right before this happened. She was supposed to have her second MMA fight uh, April eighteenth. Oh well, it didn't yeah. happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah but yeah, she's yeah. ridiculously talented. That's um, awesome. Yeah, <clears throat> so that's my next that's my next venture. The to, next to project. build a, to build a world champion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Full time. <laughs> yeah. Right? Like, yeah. She's right? Got a come on. Like, if come you on. Four, it doesn't even count. Yeah, well, she's she's going straight up. She's she's a boxer by Ooh. trade, right? Um, and uh, and now she's she hated jujitsu for. I was like, babe, you're gonna have to do jujitsu. You're gonna hate it for like six months. Yeah, you're gonna absolutely hate it. And then all of a sudden, one day, you're gonna go, oh, there's there's an arm bar right there. Okay, I'll grab that. And stuff is gonna you're gonna start being able to see things. And then it becomes fun. She, man, I'll tell you what. I stopped her from. I stopped her from from quitting jujitsu like four or five times. She says, "I'm just gonna box. I'm just gonna box. I'm just gonna box." Yeah. No, no, baby, babe. Trust me. And then of course now she's like, when she got her like first stripe on her belt, she's you know she's got that first stripe confidence, you yeah. know. And now she loves jujitsu. Her and uh, actually she she's leaving right now to go hang out with. Raquel Pa Louis. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. wow. That's cool. <laughs> yeah. Man, that's legit. Yeah, the, the world has changed, man. But man. to go back to the the um the uh methodology and everything, the there are I, I will give it to some of those guys. There's another way to get there. So there's there's my way which is to be the smartest, most technical, you know, most agile fighter possible. And then there's the be super fucking tough. The you know, and that's where, like, most of the Brazilians go for the be super tough, you know. And that the way that you're going to be super tough is by fighting constantly. And I, yeah. I understand that, but that's also a shorter career. And then after the career, you serious. don't have all your faculties. Yeah, no, like serious downfalls. Like, man, it just – and that's one thing. Like, when you look at – like, Muay Thai sometimes gets painted with that brush of, like, the original fights that where there's no concern for athletes. Nobody's thinking careers. They're, you know, they're being bet on. It's just used up. And it was just, like, the point was, like, brutalize each other as much as you can. But then there was that transition where it's like, no, we're, we're going to be athletes, and now it's going to be avoid the damage with uh -huh. giving the damage. And I feel like that was the pivotal point that put me, that really put Muay Thai like in a mainstream perspective just because people were able to see that. It was like, man, that's the real deal. You know, imagine a good boxer, but if you can kick his leg, oh, wow, if you can clinch him up and knee him or elbow him in the face, like it just it was the next evolution. And yeah, then everybody yeah. fell in love with, you know, jiu-jitsu and MMA. 
Um, but it just, it, it's definitely, like you said, a tactical approach is the best thing because man, get hit in the head is not good. You know, especially yeah. long Well, and that's why, that's why like kids, like, have you ever seen a big kids Muay Thai program? Yeah. No, it's so hard to get a kids Muay Thai program going because parents sitting on the sidelines are like, he punched him in the face. Yeah. But yeah, that's what we do. But when they're doing jujitsu, you know, they're rolling, they're grabbing this, they're grabbing that. It doesn't look as violent. However, yeah. they're Twisting choking joint. each other. Yeah. Kids are going really joints. Yeah. yeah. Right. But it just doesn't look as scary. Yeah. And so, and so that, that's why it's, it's difficult. It's, it's more difficult to build a, a Muay Thai program because you don't have the feeder kids, you know, that feed exactly. into it. You yeah. know, they, they, you have they don't tiers. typically start Muay Thai until they're, until they're at least teens. Yeah. And by then they've already missed out on all that year, uh, all those years of muscle memory and athleticism. Oh time. man, where the sponge is just empty. Yeah. You know, and that's where like, and that's where you see a lot of people have to disguise their kids striking program is like kickboxing or something to where yeah. Yeah. all the fundamentals are there, but there's safety procedures in place to where it looks good. You know, people aren't freaking out. They're not panicking but you're just like one standard deviation off of like when they hit 15, 16, you're like, now this is what you're going to do. Now you know, that'll do. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, yeah. Just, I, learned, like, I learned the, the entire it's crocodile whips his tail, the mm -hmm. crocodile kick, right. Yeah. The, they, they call it question mark kick and a bunch of other spin, names that it's not. Yeah. Spin heel, spin hook. Who knows? Yeah. 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 So I learned that kick from a 10 year old in Thailand when I was when I was like 18 somewhere around there um and this so I was I was uh, I was living at Khao Samrit which is where Anawat is from mm -hmm. yeah I was, I was living at Khao Samrit and uh and I was back and forth I think I lived there for like six months and then jockey gym yeah. um but this kid from Khao Samrit had a fight at uh, Rashid Amrun, he was yeah. like 10 years old. We go to the fight, we go to the fight, phenomenal fight. These kids are beating the crap out of each other. It's beautiful. And this kid throws a crocodile tail, blow. And I was at the gym the very next day, I camp the very next day because they don't take days off. No. You, get, you get the afternoon before your fight off. <laughs> yeah. yeah, like it's just another training session. That, you know, yeah. it's just like, yeah, man, I got to yeah. fight tonight. I'll, I'll still another, have more work yeah. to get done. Exactly, exactly. And so I, I pulled him over to the bag and I was like, show me that. Because this was like, you know, this was like 1997 or something like that. Or not, no, shoot, it had been early. It's like 96, 96, 97, somewhere around there. And this kid, this kid showed me the, the crocodile tail and I was like, this is going to be, this is going to be big. I'm going to pull this out. Nobody's going to know what hit him. And then everybody else started to learn it too. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Especially now, like with social media and the internet, man, like everything is oh, new man. for like 12 hours. And then it's in every gym across America. Yeah. Can you imagine if social media existed like then? If, so, oh, if, I, had a, if I had an Instagram in 1999, I would be making millions of dollars for my Instagram right now. <laughs> yes, absolutely, man. Because like but it came out, it came brand, along after my relevance. A, you would be an influencer, right? Yeah, influencer. You just have to take selfies of your of yourself, like wearing scandalous shirts and stuff on beaches, and like you'd make millions, yeah. man. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Follow the uh, follow the cro the the crotch fist program. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> CrossFit, sorry, CrossFit. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> oh man well it's been a good time catching up absolutely um, man anytime you know, is there anything you'd like to close with um no i think i you had some really actually really good questions there's really good questions that i have not been asked before and i've done hundreds of these right mm -hmm. the, but I, you actually had some really good questions i, I appreciated i appreciated your interview um mm -hmm. as far I like as, that. well well, like whenever we got to, well, whenever I got to meet you face to face and just, 
I mean, in all honesty, I was just, I was surprised the TV persona, you know, like how much more there was. And I mean, I was so much younger than too, like we both kind of were, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, I just, I was, I was really, you know, I was really kind of surprised by like the depth, you know, that was there is like, man, dude, this guy's like a legit serious martial artist. Like this is a major part of your life and it's influenced not only just your physical athletic prowess, but like, you know, your belief system and just the way you look at the world. And, uh, so I really, I respected you so much after, you know, that, that weekend because uh, I was already a super fan, but I was just a fan for different reasons. And so when we got to do this, I was like, man, people need to hear um, some of your perspectives and thoughts on things because I think it's going to surprise people of how, you know, calculated, yeah. you know, things. You know are how many stuff. times I've, I've heard or read, Hey, I met, I met Kit Coke today. He's totally not an asshole. <laughs> Uh, I don't feel like you got that label as much as <laughs> no, it was like, I got the, know, the party I, boy. I, like. I realized early on, I realized early on that, that, uh, and you know who I got this from was, do you remember Prince Naz? Prince Nassim Hamed. He was a boxer. Oh, yeah. That was like the way crazy back. guy. All yeah. kind of crazy, weird, punching you back from on, day, between his yes. legs and shit. Yeah super super gnarly fighter back in the day and i realized from watching him you need people that hate you and people that love you you need both you can't just be the good guy or the heel right you need yeah. both to to maximize you know butts in buckets yeah and so uh i was just like you know what's really easy for me being cocky being, being sure of myself yeah. and so that's how I was like you know what when I'm on camera when I'm on you know when I'm on stage whatever I will just be the I will be the so completely sure of myself person without being the dick yeah you know the, well, maybe the you super really cocky really you all that. suck not that you, you all really, suck uh, just that I'm great I, but you really embodied that because man like I can remember whenever like I saw you on MTV and then of course I started following and man, that's honestly what I was kind of looking up at that age. Cause I was like, man, I, I want that kind of confidence. Like, you know, I need to believe in myself like that. Cause it wasn't the arrogance part of it that I was after, you know, it was just like, man, if I could just have half of that confidence. I'll because you what, man, it's a gift. Yeah. I, I, I believe, I, I believe, I, I believe it. I, when I say it's a gift, I don't mean I'm gifted. I mean, I mean that, that confidence that I'm sure I got from my parents, mm -hmm. you know, that has, has helped me so much throughout the yeah. years. Even when I'm, when I'm coaching, when I'm coaching and I see that, you know, this, that whoever I'm coaching lacks that confidence. And if they had that little bit more confidence, that right hand could go a little bit deeper. You know, right. you could get a little more commitment out of this. You know, it's, it's definitely, it's not an extra. Yeah. It's something that you need to work on for sure. It's not a, well, he's confident. He's not. Some people are, some people aren't. No, no, no. That's something that you need to focus on. And it's very easy to do because when you level up, you did that. You did that yourself. When you learn this, Nobody can put that in your head. You had to do that. And it's fucking hard. Muay Thai is hard. Muay Thai is not easy. I'm, I have always, always maintained that I've gone head to head with all kinds of pro athletes in all kinds of different venues, foot races, all kinds of stuff. No athlete is as in good of shape as a fighter except for a gymnast that's it the only I agree with the that. only one that beats us man. is the gymnast <laughs> gymnasts are on like a whole other level like when those yeah. guys show up to start training i'm just like oh this is gonna go well exactly you know, they know exactly what to do with their body they know how to yeah. tell their body to do whatever they want the only thing that gymnasts lack is stamina that's mm -hmm. because in their program that's the only thing that they don't have to have Everything yeah. that they do is very explosive, very yeah. short and explosive. The only thing I like is, but other than that, you know, obviously phenomenal athletes, 
I think that yeah. they're the only that other than that, you will not find somebody in as good of shape as, as, as a fighter period. Yeah. Well, that's awesome, man. I'm glad yeah. to see your career, anyway, you know, like continue this is on. the next, this is the next, uh, this is the next, uh, stage right here. Yeah. So I've been building it for a few years. Just the, I was just building, I was just hashtagging it on, on Instagram because I was like, man, there's a lot of, it, it's the fact that a beta is something to be sought after now. Like, oh yeah, no, I'm totally beta. You would, you admit that when I, when I was coming up, that was like a, that dude over there is totally beta. You know, right. now it's like a thing, like a, like the people that do it on purpose, you know? Anyway, so I, I started hashtagging this and then, and then I didn't even know what a hashtag was because I was late to the party on Instagram because I didn't have an iPhone. <laughs> I was a couple of years late to the party. So here I get an iPhone finally and I start, I start, you know, hashtagging. I didn't know what a hashtag was. I was like, oh, they're funny jokes you put on at the end. Right. That's what it is. And so <laughs> when I finally figured out what it was, uh, I was actually, I was on my way out of the country, so I went on an airplane, and I was just scrolling, scrolling through the hashtags, scrolling through the Manchia hashtags to find the first one. It took me three and a half hours to find the first Manchia hashtag, and it was mine. And it was something stupid, too. It was like a, like a picture of a truck or something. I don't know. And, I, and so I've just been doing that ever since, and then finally I was like, you know what? I wonder if I could actually own that. And so I, it, what's crazy is that, two, this is Wednesday, two days ago, Monday, Monday, I got the, um, I got the full certificate from the USPTO of, I own man shit. I own, I own the word man shit. I own the trademark for man shit. Is that oh retarded? God. It's Dude, so hilarious. Like, you're like I the fought most for it for three years I fought for it because they were like, they were like, you can't, you can't uh, trademark uh, profanity. And so then, you know, the lawyer was like, this isn't profanity. This is a made up word. This word does not exist. It's not man shit, two words, it's man shit. It's one word, we made up the word. And so eventually, I, as of Monday, it is fully official. It's you can you can go to the USPTO and look up man shit, and my name will pop up. So oh, we're just doing like uh, uh, you know t-shirts and hats and yeah. fun stuff like that, and just and shirts like uh, it's it's a little egregious. It's a little in your face because it needs to be because I feel like and I'm I'm a little soapboxy at the moment, but I feel like we need to make a turn. Who's going to fight our wars? Who's going to fight our wars? All yeah. these college kids are pussies. <laughs> we need to make a turn. So well, I'm starting. I'm starting with yeah. t-shirts. <laughs> you're leading from the front, man. Like, well, I mean, like, your man card officially can never get pulled, man, because it's like, the right? dude owns it. Like, literally owns it with the United States government. So yeah. definitely that is... <laughs> so hilarious man but that's also know that you know you got yeah. something because like your persona and personality like it fits you know just thanks that man. outgoing a little bit in your face you know like you said not a, not too much but just enough right right I just, and it really fits you that point that you're that you're making uh this is a good it's actually a good point to lead off on or to to end off on which is um like i get asked all the time or I used to get asked all the time, you know, like, hey, how, how can I be the next Kit Cope? You know, like, I want to be the next Muay Thai guy or, you know, whatever it is. I say, well, the first thing that you need to do is be born gifted for that. Yeah. What you need to do is you don't want to be the next Kit Cope. You need to be the first you. To be the first you, you have to find what your thing is. If your thing is Muay Thai, awesome. Your thing might be uh, the globetrotter shit or you know or 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 
weaving or some shit like that. Like you need to find what you are gifted at and what makes you happy. And if you do that, you are going to have so much success in that area because you have passion for it. That's why I didn't keep boxing. I only had two pro boxing fights because I realized, oh, I don't love this. You know, if you have passion for what you're doing, you and, and you have found your thing, and you'll know it. You'll, I'm, dude, I knew it right away. I knew it right away. You will be, you will find so much success in finding yourself, basically. Yeah. I love that, man. I mean, that's just like, that's some profound insight from somebody that's literally been a globetrotter, not in the basketball sense, <laughs> you know, all over the world professional fighter you know television work you, you post the television shows you work with high level athletes you, you just you have so many things that you've been involved with over all the years and to hear some insight a little bit later in life i think is real valuable for a lot of people because you, just, you go back to those times whenever like i was a college kid seeing you on tv i only saw a very small part of the picture and now yeah. you have an opportunity to show people a little bit more and uh really appreciate the time man it's fun to catch up we'll definitely be staying in touch if there's anything you need, always reach out. And I really thank you. Absolutely, dude. Anytime, we'll do a follow up. Uh, hit me with your uh, with your your info, and I'll send you some man shit. Shit. Awesome. I will for sure. <laughs> All right. Later, brother.